Japan and an ongoing push for renewable energy here at home, there has been a lot of talk of late about power. And this is actually one of those rare instances when we are speaking literally and not in the political sense, although it, there is actually plenty of politics at play where energy is concerned. But in this case, it's uh, about the New York's independent system operator, otherwise known as NISO. And this is an entity that exists to make sure that New Yorkers have sufficient access to reliable power. Now, each year, the NISO uh, publishes a report on whether officials are meeting their goals. This year, they say that the outlook is quite good for the power supply, but there are some concerns for the future. So joining me now to discuss those concerns is Tom Rumsey. He's NISO's Vice President for External Affairs. Tom, thanks for being here. It's a pleasure to be here, Liz. Thank you. So, okay, in the past, what I think people, most people know about energy is that they turn the lights on or they turn the mixer on or they turn the AC on in particular and they expect it to work. That's correct. And we are coming up at, at a time where demand gets quite high. That would be summer. And um, sometimes we have blackouts, and so people are concerned about reliability. That's where you guys come in. That is our primary concern. Reliability is the one thing that we focus all of our efforts on to make sure that when they do flip the switch, the lights do come on. And last year we had actually a week which set a record for New York State in terms of energy usage in July. And what was unique about that was the year prior in 2009, we saw the first ever decline in power usage since the Great Depression. And so when you had that latent reserve show up in July at a time when peak and typical demand was low, mm. it, it led to some interesting times. But, but we had sufficient planning and resources in place, either through generation or demand response, to meet a record all-time peak. Yeah, what, sort of what you guys do is energy management in some ways. You can call large energy consumers and say, hey guys, can you voluntarily power down at a point where there's high demand, right? You can well, manage the stream <clears throat> in that way? A, a little bit, but it's, it's not uh, voluntary. Actually, it's one of the values the competitive markets have brought is it's created this new industry called demand response. We contract with large energy users like an Alcoa and we test them twice a year to make sure that they can meet the contractual obligations of their demand response contracts that say, if we call you, we have to give them a 24-hour notice that tomorrow we may need to call you. And then they do reduce their usage during peak demand periods, which is a significantly lower economic impact to consumers than if you had to have a generation meet that demand. I'm actually always surprised by how close we are. So forecast peak demand for 2011, you believe is going to be um, about 32,712 uh, 32, megawatts. That's what you think. That's correct. Actual peak demand for 2010 was 33,452 megawatts, and the record was 33,939. I mean, you're talking... Uh, that's, we're pretty close in terms of what we can generate and what, when, what people want, aren't we? No, what you're seeing there is peak demand usage. Now, what's available um, is we take peak demand. Um, total generation, if you look, look up here, is, is close to 38,000. Ah, okay. So what we do is we take the peak demand and then we have roughly a 15 to 18 percent reserve margin on top of that to ensure that we have adequate, adequate resources. So why do we think that, that peak demand this year is going to be lower than it was in the past, slightly lower? There's really two key drivers for that. One is, well, actually three. The, the economy is, is recovering, albeit very slowly, and so you have seen from a peak demand period, uh, we're still down from three years ago in our usage. Secondly, you're starting to see some impacts from the uh, energy efficiency programs across the state. And third, we're anticipating a more wild, mild summer than we had last year. So you're going to see a little decline. Again, last year we set all-time record uh, in July for a week usage in, in New York City. So there are issues, though, coming down the pike. I mean, first of all, one is about renewables, right? Yeah. There are goals that the president has set goals, the governor has set goals in terms of getting the, the country and the state off of the reliance on foreign oil, quote-unquote, is the catchphrase, right? right? And going to things like wind and solar, and, um, and then, of course, there's the issue of gas. So but let's first go to the question of um, renewables. I mean, mm -hmm. we are not... California. We are not. <laughs> right, okay. And we're not, although, like, for example, in the Tug Hill Plateau, there's a lot mm -hmm. of wind, we're not the windiest state in the world either. So isn't there going to be a moment where we just can't go any farther with renewables? Well, you have a national look and you have a state look. Across the state, we have roughly 1,300 megawatts of wind. Uh, we have a capacity for roughly 8,000. Now, this is just onshore. So it, we, we have plenty of room to grow more renewables. Uh, the challenge that renewables have are their, var their variable resources. Um, you can look globally, you know, if Spain put a large uh, build of wind, but they matched it megawatt for megawatt with gas turbines, and it was a dramatic drain on their economy. We don't do it that way. Mm. We've modeled it where we believe we can successfully integrate up to 8,000 megawatts of wind um, 
in a, in a way that does not impact reliability. Uh, the, the challenge that we're facing with renewables in New York is the ability of the transmission system to interconnect them uh, successfully so we can get the demand from upstate and western New York down into the city. And as I've actually talked on this program before with, with, uh, with other guests, there's a problem in terms of transmission getting it into the city because right down, um, right around the Union Point area actually <laughs> is Where? a bottleneck. Yeah, I know. We don't want to talk about that. Is a bottleneck. Um, and you and I were talking before mm -hmm. you, you came on. There's actually, uh, in the next 10 years, there are two yeah. major lines that are going to have to upgrade that will per right. potentially improve that dramatically. Right. We're at a very unique period in, in time where we have the opportunity to take these historic bottlenecks. I mean, New York State's grid was built from the bottom up by these monopoly uh, utilities that own generation transmission and a piece of geography. There wasn't a lot of statewide coordination or planning from the beginning. So since competitive markets have come in, we've had the ability now to see from a statewide perspective where are these bottlenecks and how can we correct them. And we have a uh, almost a unique period in time where these are going to these specific lines Utica to the capital region capital region down into the city um, are the two real strong bottlenecks they're going to have to be replaced because of the age of those transmission lines now to replace them in kind or to improve them to re alleviate this this congestion is really the discussion point if you can improve the amount of transmission uh, capability along those right-of-ways so you're not having to create a new corridor right. then you can allow the generators in western and upstate New York to compete and sell energy down into the city during peak demand periods and not just when the transmission system is not constrained. Will that address the issue of taking Indian Point offline, which is something that I think uh, is obviously the governor, it's a priority for the governor, it's a priority for the state attorney general, uh, and it can't happen immediately because you have to replace the energy that Indian Point creates. If more generation could be dealt with in western New York, for example, would the, and you can improve transmission, could you take Indian Point offline? Well, transmission, a robust transmission system allows you to do a number of things. It allows you to bring a lot more renewables on. It allows you to let the generators in western New York compete, and it would allow this price differential that you have between New York City, the capital region, and western New York to levelize, and so you'd see um, lower costs across the state. Specific to Indian Point, um, you know, those license renewals are up in 13 and 15, respectively, right. and our analysis showed uh, our base case was done last year, and we 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 did our base case with Indian Point being relicensed. Uh, if that occurs, and the traditional retirements that we anticipate coming with the ad additional generation we anticipate coming, all happens, we're good for the next 10 years. If, however, those licenses are not renewed, then by 2016 we would have a reliability issue in, in and around New York City if we don't bring re other resources to bear uh, in order to shut those down. And in that time frame, I think the most viable options are going to be new generation, some demand response, and some transmission lines that are already pretty far along in the permitting line. So if, in fact, new generation, could that come from hydrofracking if the state decided to get into the business of that? Well, hydrofracking is used to, to extract natural gas. Um, if you look at, uh, I don't see it, that as having a direct impact on the Indian point. What, what you see across the state is the generation, the new generation of choice, because uh, natural gas plants do have the ability to, to modify uh, their output with wind very well. They integrate with renewables very well. They're relatively low capital costs. They're relatively easy to permit comparatively. Um, and the gas prices are low. We, we saw a price um, decrease uh, from 08 to 09. It went down 50% because natural gas prices went down. But as we rely more heavily on natural gas, already 50% plus for New York State, um, then an adequate supply of that natural gas is going to become a national interest. So we actually should just, in closing, point out that at the NISO itself does not have actually a position on whether hydrofracking should be actual or Indian Point should be closed or any of this because, no. again, your, your job is... We are a non-profit, independent Yes, and you are utility. probably quite pleased about <laughs> yes, that. Yes, we are, and we just try to give the policymakers the data to make the decisions. Well, thanks for coming in. It is uh, very interesting, and if you happen to be a wonk and really want to read this yeah, Absolutely. Thing, All over our website, which I'm sure is popular in Google. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.